Okay, we'll continue with Federalist number two. This is the second paragraph. Nothing is more certain than the indispensable necessity of government. And it is equally undeniable that whenever and however it is instituted, the people must see to it some of their natural rights in order to vest it with requisite powers. It is well worthy of consideration, therefore, whether it would conduce more to the interest of the people of America that they should, to all general purposes, be one nation under one federal government than that they should divide themselves into separate confederacies and give to the head of each the same kind of powers which they are advised to place in one national government. Notice the first sentence, nothing is more certain than the indes indispensable necessity of government. When they say something is indispensable, they, uh, one, of, one of the books that was written about George Washington, the title of it was The Indispensable Man. means it's a person or a thing that you cannot do without. It's very important. This person is very, very important. So here it says, Everybody that's got a little brain knows that you have to have a good government in place. Otherwise, you'll have chaos and craziness. So he says, we all agree that we have to have a government, a working good government. And it's equally undeniable that whenever and however it is instituted, Remember, this is echoing from the Declaration of Independence. You institute a government. Governments are creation of the people. They are not given from above, from God. Because the kings used to say, we, were, we are here, we are in power, because that's what God wanted. For the longest time, the organized religion used to say that. We are here because God wants us to rule over you, and you just shut up and listen. And as Renaissance came by, and eventually as the American Revolution that time, they turned around and said, no. People are the ultimate voice. People have the ultimate say. Not you, king, not you, pope, or you, whoever religious authority you want to say you are. No, we institute the government ourselves. So he says, when you institute a government, it is just common sense that you seed. Seed means you give part of your right so that you all can live together. I'll give you an example. If you are in a desert where there's nothing around, you just get in a car, you can go 100 miles an hour, you don't have to stay in a lane, do whatever you want. You might hurt yourself, but you're not going to hurt anybody else. But the minute you come inside a city and you build a city, you make roads, you want to take your kids to school, you want to get to work safely and soundly, you say, no. When I was in the desert, I had every right to go 100 miles an hour, as long as I was hurting myself, nobody else. But now that I'm in the city, I elect city council members, and they in turn decide to build roads for us. We give them the money, they build the road, and then they put a speed limit. They put lights, and we have to respect that. So we cede some of our right 
to not go 100 miles an hour anymore. Be careful for others. So anytime you have any form of government, you give some of your rights so that you can keep the main rights. So here's what he's saying. He says we have to agree that we have to, if we come under one government, then we have to give up part of our rights so that we can be safe, so that we have avenue to prosperity and peace and liberty, because we don't want chaos. So we give some of our power, and in order to vest it with requisite powers, in order that it will be, the government will be energetic, that it will have enough power to do what we want it to do. So you vest power in it, you give power to it, so that it, it will have the required things to carry on its mission. It is well worthy of consideration, therefore, whether it would conduce more to the interest of the people of America that they should, to all general purposes, be one nation. And this is really important that we have to be Americans, we people of the 13 states. We have to unite and be one people, one nation. Because don't forget, all the way up to American Civil War in 1860s, they used to say United States are. They didn't used to say United States is. So he's pleading with people that you have to give up part of your sovereignty, part of your rights as a member of one state, so that this big state, this big union can have enough energy can have enough requisite powers to carry on and do the job it's supposed to and make you proud because when you unite, then the British, the French, the Spanish are not going to come around and toy around with you. Why? Because after the war, the British said, you guys are weak. We're not going to let your ships go to our other colonies and trade with them. So all the colonies that they had around Caribbean, they would not allow the American ships there because Americans were not united. There were 13 different states. So British were saying, you're weak. You don't have a say in this. So John Jay is reminding people that if we stay disunited, we will be weak. Nobody will take us seriously. So he says we have to come together and act like one nation, one strong nation, so that not only ourselves, but our posterity, future generations, will benefit from it. And he says, don't be fooled by all these people that say they should divide themselves into separate confederacies that there are some people that say there's 13 states too big to unite. Let's make four confederacies out of it. Let make, let's make three confederacies. He's going to say don't be fooled by it because the minute you change this into three confederacies before you know it, the British will drive a wedge between you, in other words divide you, and then put you against one another with the three or four confederacies against one another, and before you know it, you'll be at war. So this speaks to our situation in the world. This is how we are. We have, as human beings, we have one weakness, and it's self-made weakness. We have put ourselves in different countries and we worship the countries now. It's a sickness. And it's interesting that a lot of Europeans, now Americans, and some other people who are 
calling themselves Christians. Forget what the Ten Commandments says. It says don't make idols in front of you. Don't, don't worship idols. We have made our countries into idols. That is crazy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we can all of a sudden forget about our differences. I said our differences in a beautiful way are our strengths. They're, they give a different window to, it, to the way we look at the world. But our differences compared to what we share, our shared humanity, is nothing, is minute. If we anchor ourselves in our humanity, then we can appreciate our diversity in a healthy way. Not spend most of our budget on war making. So as we go forward, please keep that in mind, that our differences, our diversity is beautiful. Our different languages are beautiful. But if we want to live up to our potential on our only home, this planet Earth, which the creator of the universe has blessed us with, this is the cradle of life, that we have to be, we have to unite not only to be good to one another now, but to be good to one another, to other species, to other sentient beings. We think that we can live without them, without other forms of life. We cannot. We are so interwoven in our lives with them that we have to be respectful of all other forms of life on this planet. Because that's how we get our sustenance. It's where we get our strength. So and we have to keep this beautiful planet beautiful for the future generations. Don't forget that. All right.